That's uh, really a great pleasure for me being here uh, to tell you about uh, some of our research. Uh, this is uh, in the field of nano-optics, but more specifically, I would like to illustrate in this talk how we use nano-optics as an enabling technology, both to advance uh, fundamental physics, but also uh, to address some very concrete down-to-earth uh, applications. So before I start talking about uh, science, I'd like to say a few words about uh, ICFO, so ICFO, where I come from. Uh, so this stands uh, for the Institute of Photonic uh, Sciences, and we are located about uh, 15 kilometers south uh, of, of Barcelona. So ICFO is one of the institutes, research institutes, that were uh, created back in the years 2000 um, by, the, by the Catalan government in order to strengthen, let's say, research uh, efforts uh, in the region. Uh, ICFO is dedicated to photonics, was uh, created in 2002 by uh, Professor Lewis Stoner with the aim uh, of advance the very limit of knowledge uh, in photonics. So I was lucky enough uh, when I joined 2002 uh, to be part, let's say, of the, of the creation of the institute. At that time, we were 10 people. And uh, now, uh, if I give you a few figures, so we call ourselves ICFONIANS, so we are more than 400 ICFONIANS. Uh, activities are organized in about 25 uh, research groups. These are very international uh, institutions with more than 50 nationalities that are represented. And uh, we are now working in a building of uh, 14,000 square meters, and we are now building actually an extension uh, of the building. So, ICFO uh, aims at being active in all the cutting edge, uh, <coughs> let's say, aspects of photonics. And activities uh, are really ranging from the very fundamental to the, to the very applied. Uh, our research is organized virtually in uh, four different uh, departments, light for information, light for energy, light for health. And whenever we have some research that is not fitting in one of these three, uh, basically, we have a light, light for everything. So my field of expertise, as uh, Christophe explained to you in the introduction, is uh, nano-optics. So that means that we're interested in the interaction of light with nano-sized uh, matter. And what is uh, fundamentally interesting about uh, nano-optics, about shining light on nanostructures, is basically that for a given material, when dimensions are reduced in nanoscale, some new optical properties are popping up compared to what happened at the micro scale. So a very good example for that is what happens with uh, noble metals. So I'm going to give this example to illustrate a bit of motivation for nano-optics. This is a material we're going to see throughout the, uh, the talk later on. So, uh, just imagine that I have uh, in my pocket a piece of, of gold and I shine my laser pointer on top of it. In that case, what I would have is uh, just a very expensive reflective uh, surface, but nothing more. Things are very different if instead of uh, dealing with a macroscopic gold object, I would have a nanostructure, nanoparticle made of gold. So I'm talking about object that would be typically in the range of 10 to 100 nanometers. These nanoparticles uh, have the peculiarity to support some electromagnetic resonances that are called localized surface plasma resonances. And that correspond, these resonances, to a collective, a coherent oscillation of the electron cloud with the incident electromagnetic field. This localized surface plasma resonance leads to a, a peak, a resonance, in the extinction of the particle. Because I'm dealing with, in fact, a nano resonator, like any resonator, whenever, whenever I'm going to change the dimension, uh, the shape, and the con constitutive material of my resonator, I'm going to be able to change the resonance, and I can do that for noble metals all the way from the green to the near infrared. So actually, what you see here are solutions of uh, colloidal metallic nanoparticles of different size, shape, and constitutive material. And you can see, uh, basically, an illustration of the effect of the plasma resonance. So I'm talking about 
a peak in the extinction. So that means that basically if I take one of these uh, solution, I'm going to shine light, white light, with a well-defined direction, and I'm going to look in transmission to transmitted light. At the plasma resonance, I'm going to see basically a decrease in the transmitted light, so the light is going to be extinguished, and there are two reasons for this extinction. One is scattering, scattering of light in other direction than the detection direction, and the other one is absorption of the material. Okay? So what I'm saying is that the plasma resonance in the extinction is associated to a resonance in the scattering, but also in the absorption. So let's look at each of these two contributions. What about scattering? So at the plasma resonance, we're going to shine light. I'm going to have some very special optical properties conferred by this plasma resonance. The first one is that because I'm dealing with an object that is sub-wavelength, light is going to be confined evanescently at the surface of the metal. I'm going to be able, actually, to shape my particle in order to reach confinement well beyond lambda. I can actually, this acts a bit like a concentrator of light, and eventually I'm going to be able to achieve at the surface of the metal some field enhancement or field intensity uh, enhancement compared to what would be, let's say, the incident uh, light intensity. And because, again, I'm dealing with a, an optical resonator, eventually the resonator is going to be very sensitive to its environment, and that means that basically I can use uh, this nano resonator at the sensor, as an efficient sensor of the environment. So this is for the optical part, the scattering part. What about the absorption uh, part? So eventually we're gonna, what I'm going to have is a punctual source of heat that can be remotely controlled with light. I will have the ability at the plasma resonance to have an efficient light to heat conversion. Eventually, I'm going to be able to control the gradients of temperature to a level that goes well beyond uh, most of the other technologies to generate heat. And because, again, I'm dealing with an object that is very tiny, the dynamics for heating up and cooling down are going to be very fast. So this is just an illustration, as I said, of uh, these special uh, optical properties that are popping up from squeezing, basically, the size of an object from the macro scale to the nano scale. So as a philosophy, I would say, over the last years, what we do in the group is using these uh, peculiar properties in order, let's say, a bit like an enabling technology, like a tool, uh, to basically overcome some roadblocks, either in other subfield of physics, but also with other disciplines of science, like, for instance, chemistry and medicine. So I know, so in here at NS, there are many different uh, profiles and interests. So I've tried to select basically three different topics that are hopefully going to be, uh, let's say, touching the interest of uh, each of you in the room. So I'm going to basically talk about uh, what we like to call levitation uh, optomechanics. Uh, I'm going to then move to. Uh, the use of nano-optics for development of uh, diagnostic platform, integrated lab on chip technologies. And finally, I'm going to move to how we can use the photothermal properties of these nanoparticles, what I've just mentioned, uh, to develop some new, uh, very concrete, down-to-earth uh, applications. So let me start with the first topic. So there are experts in the room in optomechanics, so uh, I'm just giving this introduction, basically, uh, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So, as you know, optomechanics is the field that studies the interplay between light and mechanical motion in an optical resonator. And typically, when we want to describe an optomechanical system, there is a model system that is the following that, that is used. So this is a cavity formed by two mirrors, and one of these mirrors is attached to a spring and hence is movable. Because of radiation pressure of light coupled uh, into the cavity, so radiation pressure exerted on the mirrors, basically are going to have a coupling between the intracavity optical field and 
basically the motion of this spring. So this is the optomechanical uh, coupling. Uh, optomechanics is a field that has been uh, very active, especially uh, over the last, should I say, 10 or 15 years, uh, with different motivations. Uh, one motivation is the will, basically, to try to test quantum mechanics who object a larger mesoscopic object and find a transition between the classical and the quantum world. Motivation for quantum information processing, but also for the detection of ultra weak uh, uh, forces and metrology. So when you look in the literature, there is a full zoo of optomechanical, um, optomechanical system. Yeah, many of them, may, very different from each other. I give you here uh, four different examples. Uh, this is, of course, not exhaustive. We have here some uh, me membranes that are structured. So this is uh, from TU Dell, from here, from LKB, from uh, Niels Bohr Institute. You can have a nanobeam, for instance. You can have these uh, ring resonators that have been really uh, pushed uh, extensively by the Kippenbex group. And more recently, maybe these uh, structures that are these photonic crystal uh, nano beams, and as I said, many, many other structures. Because there are so many different structures, uh, one need in order to kind of assess the performance of a given op optomechanical system to define some figures of merit. And one uh, important figure of merit is the so-called uh, QF factor, where Q is the mechanical Q factor, so the, some whole sharp is the mechanical resonance, and F is the mechanical frequency. So this is indeed a quantity that is involved in many different aspects of optomechanics, uh, when you want to do force sensing, when you want to cool down your system, and somehow define the coherence of your quantum state. So I have a fact that I want to maximize. I have two parameters I can play with. And basically, the first one that has been observed, let's say, lately in the community is to try to increase F by decreasing the size of the mechanical resonator. So if I do that, indeed, this is something that happens. I'm going to increase f. But unfortunately, there's no free lunch. Uh, we're going to observe that the mechanical q factor will actually decrease. So I win on one side, but I lose on the other one. In order to illustrate my statement, I'd like to show this graph. This is extracted from this uh, uh, review article, where basically you see the mechanical q factor as a function of the size of the mechanical os uh, oscillator for many, many different systems, all the way from the very tiny ones to the very large ones. And you see this kind of uh, empirical uh, law that makes basically the mechanical Q factor is going linearly down with the re reduction in size of the system. And there are many different reasons for that, clamping, surface losses, material defects, and many uh, reasons for, the, for this to happen. So is there a room around, uh, let's say, a, a strategy around this problem to address this issue? I'm going to show one strategy. I'm not saying this is the only one. This is one strategy we have been interested in. And this is what is shown here on this graph. Uh, what you see is basically a side view of an objective lens in a vacuum chamber where you focus an ND yak laser and basically, here at the focus of, the, of, the, of this, uh, of this uh, beam, focus beam, there is uh, a nanoparticle that is trapped. This is a silica nanoparticle of 150 nanometers. And so eventually, in this approach, all mechanical resonator is going to be the nanoparticle evolving in the optical potential of this optical trap. In fact, it's not a single oscillator. These are three different oscillators along the three different directions. Okay? And if I look at, let's say, the frequency space, what is called the uh, power spectrum density, I'm going to observe, let's say, these three different resonances. A first major difference with conventional mechanical resonators, where the frequency of the mechanical mode would be defined by the geometry of the mechanical oscillator and the material properties. Here, everything is defined by the trap features in other terms, by the stiffness of my potential. Okay? And so this is illustrated here. The stiffness here is going to be 
uh, related to the alpha p, that is the polarizability of my nanoparticle, the intensity within the trap, divided by uh, the square of the size of the beam. Okay? And this over the, last, uh, over the three different uh, axes. So if you look at that and you look at the power spectrum density with the three different peaks, uh, you, you will understand very easily that z, that is the optical axis, is actually separated from the rest because the gradient is less, uh, is less in, the, in the z axis, in the optical axis. But you may be surprised by the fact that these two guys are not degenerated. In fact, it's very simple. We break the symmetry here by using uh, an optical laser that is linearly polarized. So just this small asymmetry induced by the linear polarization makes that we can basically split x from y. OK? So eventually, you have a system that is not clamped. Because it is not clamped mechanically, I can expect you're going to have, a priori, a very high mechanical Q factor, despite the fact that the object is very tiny. So these are for the people that are working in the clean room. They will appreciate my argument. There's no need for fabrication. So basically, you use a solution, colloidal solution of these particles. They are all of high quality. They don't have much uh, fabrication defect, material defect. The mass is typically an atogram. So this is a, is a big object compared to an atom, but this is not too big neither. And I put low scattering recoil because we're going to discuss that. We're going to come back to that in a moment, OK? Especially for the cooling experiment. So I I'm telling you, OK, this is a well-isolated system uh, mechanically. So we expect this Q factor to be very high, to the mechanical resonance to be very picky. And so how picky? Uh, this is illustrated here. This is uh, a measure of the mechanical Q factor as a function of the pressure within the chamber. At this pressures, uh, we expect the main uh, damping, uh, let's say, uh, phenomenon to be the gas damping in, in the chamber. So basically, the kick of the molecules. And basically, you see here that uh, we expect, because of that, a linear dependence with the pressure within the, the chamber. And you can see that at a pressure 10 to the minus 6, you're going to reach a Q factor of about 10 to the 8. It's quite high value. Oh, sorry for that. And in fact, if you uh, position that into the same graph I showed you before, uh, we see already that the system is behaving in a different way. It's a different way just because it sits off axis of all these other values, all these other systems I was showing you before. Like always, when you do an experiment with an optical trap, you should always check the literature of this gentleman that uh, shared the Nobel Prize uh, the, uh, last year in physics. And so this is uh, basically a paper from Ashkin from 1976. And while he was interested in, in uh, cooling atoms, he was already doing some experiments, trapping particles in vacuum. And he has this sentence at the end of the abstract of the paper where he say, the calculated time for an oscillating particle to decay to half amplitude due to the intrinsic optical damping at zero pressure is 0 0.7 year. OK? So he was already pointing out here a very interesting system. Curiously, after that, people have just kind of forgot about it. And let's say lately, uh, there is some interest around it. So what is the experiment, uh, let's say, uh, made of? This is a very simple experiment, actually, where you have a small vacuum chamber with the objective I was mentioning, I was showing you before in the picture. As I said, we are focusing this uh, 164 nanometer laser with an objective lens that has a numerical aperture of 0.8. Okay? Uh, we have a detection lens here in order to monitor correctly the position of the particle. We're going to use homodyne detection on a balance detector in order to measure very accurately the position of the particle in the three different axes. And in front of the trapping laser, we're going to put an EOM. And this EOM is here to modulate the intensity of the trapping laser. If you remember what I was saying before when I was showing the peaks of the three different oscillators, I was telling you eventually everything is defined by the optical potential. So that means that if I have, a, I have an EOM and I can modulate the intensity of the trapping laser, depending on what I'm going to put as an input of my EOM, I can strongly influence the dynamic of my particle. 
<coughs> so I can drive the particle. And actually, there are very interesting nonlinear dynamics to be uh, observed. I can try to cool it down, to cool down the center of mass. I can put some noise. I can do many different things. So today, for the sake of, uh, of time, we're going to focus on the cooling. And I'm going to show you different ways, approaches toward cooling of the center of mass of this subject with the eventual idea of cooling down an object to ground state at room temperature without using any uh, cryostat. So we're going to start with uh, parametric feedback cooling. So here what we're going to do uh, is basically just imagine the particle is moving in the potential. And so whenever the particle will go away with a positive velocity away from the equilibrium pos uh, position, we're going to make the, the trap stiffer for a short time in order to slow it down. Conversely, whenever the particle will go down to, toward the equilibrium position with a negative velocity, we're going to relax the potential. Okay? And by doing that, eventually, we're going to cool down the center of mass. In practice, what we're going to do is that we're going to monitor the position of the particle along x, y, and z. We're going to um, multiply by 2 the frequency, adjust the phase, and we're going to send that back into the EOM. Interestingly, because these three peaks are separated in frequency, I can actually cool down with the same laser the three different oscillators. Okay? I just have to do the same operation for x, y, and z. Okay? Eventually, if I look at that, exactly what I've said in terms of uh, Langevin equation, this is the oscillator, my simple oscillator equation, where F gas basically the random kicks of the molecule within the chamber. What I've said, just said here is kind of a eta x, x dot kind of feedback. So that means I need this term x, x dot, where uh, x is, uh, the x-axis uh, x dot, in, uh, of course, is the velocity. So eventually, if I put that, I'm going to have an additional dumping term into, into my Langevin equation. And this is what's going to uh, cool down my system. So these are already, as you can see, quite old data. These are data of uh, Jan. And I put Lucas here, because this is uh, really something we, start, we started together. And actually, Lucas was not only supervising, he was also sitting in the lab. And so uh, this is the temperature of the center of mass of the nanoparticle along x, y, and z as a function of pressure. And so what you are seeing here is that the cooling rate of my parametric feedback cooling is constant. But as I, I pump down into my chamber, the reheating rate of the gas is decreasing. So eventually, my temperature of the center of mass is going down. OK? So this is what we see here. You see this jump here. This jump here is that whenever we increase the gain of the feedback, so the eta coefficient, we just increase it a bit. And that brings everything a bit uh, down. And eventually, what we can get is to a temperature of about 50 millikelvin. OK? Since then, uh, since the first experiment, things have improved a lot. And this is an experiment that has been uh, performed by Vijay Vane in the group of Lucas, where basically, OK, this is in the number, this is uh, quantified in the occupation number of phonons, but this is a temperature of uh, 400 microkelvin. This corresponds to about 60 phonons. And there is, in this study, something very interesting. Because I was telling you, basically, the mechanical Q factor is going linearly up as I decrease my pressure. And, and basically, I was also showing you that the number of phonons, or the temperature of the center of mass, was going linearly down as I was pumping into my chamber. But in fact, of course, this does not continue infinitely. And what we observe here is basically when there is a change, a deviation from uh, let's say, the lin linear dependence. So what do we see here? We see the number of phonons, or the temperature of the center of mass, as you prefer, going down linearly with the pressure, as we saw before. But suddenly, this thing is reaching a plateau. And so here, we are still in the regime where the main source of damping 
is gas. Till we pump down to 10 to the minus 7, milli, uh, seven millibars. And here, this is eventually uh, shot noise radiation pressure. So basically, the random kicks of the own photons that are basically uh, limiting, that are reacting the system and uh, leading to this basically threshold in the system. So I was saying low recoil, uh, scattering recoil, but not so low because eventually this what ends up uh, limiting uh, basically the number of phonons I can, I can reach at that stage. <coughs> I would like to show another kind of uh, uh, feedback that is basically not anymore a parametric feedback cooling, but what is a direct feedback. So here, instead of modulating my potential, I'm going to keep the potential fixed. And what I'm going to do is to add a force that's going to be a damping force that is somehow push back the particle to the equilibrium position, but maintaining the potential <coughs> fix. There are different advantages. It's maybe not uh, um, the place where to detail these things. But basically, a priori, uh, from the perspective of optimal control, this thing should be the optimum way of cooling down a system like this one. So how do we do that? We're going to proceed in a different way. Now we maintain the trapping intensity <laughs> constant. But what we're going to do, we're going to use the charge at the surface of the particle together with an electric field created by two electrodes. So I don't know, probably from where you are, you cannot see here. There's a small spot. This is the particle that is trapped. These are the two electrodes that are applying the electric field. There's a detection lens here. And somewhere here, there is a, an electrode they're going to enable, basically, to control by corona discharge the charge at the surface of the nanoparticle. OK? We can do that in a very accurate way. Actually, these small steps you see here are really control of a single charge. So we can go down, discharge, or we can charge. And eventually, we can really control very accurately the charge at the surface of the particle. And eventually, if we apply using uh, optimal control, as I mentioned uh, to you before, we can basically cool down the center of mass of the particle in a very efficient way. I'll, I'll skip the detail here. And at that case, we are of about 3 millikelvins, not yet optimized. Let's say this is optimal control. So this is optimized, but the setup itself is not optimized. So there are many things to improve. And we are in the range of, let's say, hundreds of phonons. Eventually, when I use these active feedbacks, because these are active feedbacks, I'm monitoring the object and I'm trying to cool down the center of mass of this system. Uh, there are many limitations. So, uh, particularly, I've mentioned scattering recall, I've mentioned, I've not mentioned, but there is a feedback noise. Provided I'm doing an active process, I'm re injecting noise into the system and, and some uh, experimental issues. So, I was mentioning that eventually you would like to reach ground state, so less than one uh, phonon in the system, which would correspond to about six microkelvin. And you have seen we are at tens or hundreds of, of phonons right now. We're not yet convinced that these feedbacks would actually bring to ground state, but we're also pursuing another approach, is basically consisting of doing cavity cooling. So using a high finesse cavity to, to cool down the center of mass of the object. So I don't know how, I'm sure, well, let's say, the expert in optomechanics, of course, they know. But for the others, let me briefly explain uh, how is my view on that. So basically, you have a mechanical oscillator at frequency omega m. So low frequencies, we are talking about 150 kilohertz. And here you have uh, the laser and the cavity at frequency omega. And you have this object that is oscillating in the optical field. And so eventually, if you look in the frequency regime, you're going to have side bands, so at omega minus omega m, and omega plus omega m. So in fact, this guy corresponds to uh, basically removing a phonon to a system and emitting a photon of higher energy. Of course, and, and this corresponds to the opposite process. 
Of course, these two guys have the same probability to happen. But if I put a high finesse cavity here and somehow I boost one of the channels, I'm going to be able to cool down the system. So this is something that was proposed theoretically on this levitating system uh, by, uh, let's say, in these two papers in 2010. So this is the setup that enables to do that. We have the high finesse cavity in this chamber. There is a, a, a valve here uh, that separates the load lock from the main chamber. So we're going to have a trap that's going to move the particle all the way through. And basically, I'm going to show you here. So basically, this is the mobile trap that brings into the cavity. And there is another trap here that is more stable that's going to be able to manipulate the particle within the cavity. Uh, we have a cavity of about 200,000 finesse. So these are the features you see here. OK? So let me illustrate how it works. So the particle is coming all the way from the load lock. You see this bright spot here? This is the scattering from the nanoparticle. And we're going to actually transfer the nanoparticle from the long range to the short range trap. So this will come in the second video on the right. So you see the small dot here? This is trapped by this lens. We're going to increase the, the, the intensity in this uh, trap and suddenly transfer the particle from one trap to another. And then the particle will be accurately controlled throughout the cavity field. So for the sake of time, again, I'm not showing all the details. So I just would like to share with you what is the current status of the experiment. This is, again, the center of mass temperature of the object. And what we show here is the detuning of the cavity. OK? So remember, we are dealing uh, here with uh, mechanical frequencies of the oscillator of so the omega m is about 100 kilohertz. And this shows I'm detuning the peak of the cavity, so all the way from here to there. And what you see is that basically there is an optimum whenever the cavity mode overlaps with the right sideband. Okay? We are at 30 millikelvin. It's still far away from ground state. There are, as you can imagine, like many uh, issues, technological issues, and instability, and reheating processes that we have to fight against. But this is basically what we are doing right now. To finish with this part, I would like to, uh, because you can tell me, OK, nano-optics, you, you was telling about nano-optics in the introduction, but there's not much nano-optics in here. So one of the things we'd like to do is basically, beyond working with these high finesse cavity, let's say microscopic ones, to actually couple this levitating nanoparticle with near-field optical cavities. Okay? And the reason for that is that, in that case, the object is basically commensurable with the size of the mode of the nanocavity. And eventually, you can imagine that this leads to a very high optomechanical coupling, meaning that a small movement of the nanoparticle is going to affect very strongly uh, the nanocavity uh, near-field and spectrum. So this related to some work we did in the past. At that time, that was in solution. So that was really optical trapping experiment. And so uh, we were using, inspired by these two uh, theoretical proposals, the near field of plasmatic nanostructures in order to trap very tiny objects in the near field of these metallic, of these plasmatic nanostructures. So this is the illustration. So basically. This is the spectrum. So this is a kind of a bow tie ant antenna that is represented here. All that is sub-wavelength. All that is metal, and this is a hole into the metal. This is the empty antenna with the near field associated to it. And this is whenever the particle is jumping in. And you can appreciate, basically, how the near field of the nano antenna or the nano cavity is strongly modified by the presence of the, of the, ca of the nanoparticle, and as well how the spectrum is strongly affected by the presence of the nanoparticle. So uh, we did some experiment in liquid, basically, where we studied the different detuning and to understand a bit how the system works. And right now, what we try to do is basically to apply, so coming back to vacuum, to apply what we learned, let's say, in the uh, microscopic uh, cavity to this uh, photonic crystal cavity. So here, this is a silicon nitride membrane that has been patterned. The periodicity of the defects here actually changing in the center of the nano beam, and this is where we're going to create a defect and create this photonic crystal cavity. This is the associated near field. 
and so actually, so now this is an optical quality factor that is of uh, 5,000 here. In fact, this week we had good news so that we were actually reaching 10 to the 4. So this uh, starts to be an interesting system um, to, to study coupling of levitating our particle in near field. On that, I'll go very fast because uh, this related to uh, the beautiful work of uh, Tom Delors and Gabriel Ete here at LPA. So basically, whenever uh, you want to go toward another kind of nanoparticles, everything I've shown here is about silica nanoparticle. And it's not a random choice. This is just because whenever you pump down into the chamber, if you deal with a particle that has a slightly higher uh, absorption, basically higher than silica, the temperature is going to be so high just because the dissipation of energy of heat is so inefficient that you're just going to blow the nanoparticle. So optical trapping of particles is very nice for silica nanoparticles where whenever you're going to go to semiconductor quantum dots, to NV centers in diamond and other things, uh, they're going to be very complicated. So a way around that, and as I said, something that is pursued here uh, very uh, uh, nicely uh, by the group of, uh, of Ete and, and Delors, and basically here the, there is uh, using a pole trap in order to do this levitation optomechanics with this more interesting system. So this is our geometry, this uh, end cap with uh, here the scattering of the of the nanodiamond. So we are dealing with nanodiamond that are 40 nanometers big. They are from Adamas and they are supposed to contain between one and four NV centers. These are the perfect spectrum density. And basically, as I said, I go fast because I don't want to put too much time emphasis on that. This shows basically that we can do some cooling as well with the pole trap. And uh, we can see how basically the mechanical Q factor uh, goes up as we decrease uh, the pressure in the, the, the chamber and we apply uh, this feedback. This is the emission properties of these single envy centers that we, that we detect. So how much time do I have? I have the feeling I'm talking very 10 minutes, so let me go. Of course, the two other parts are going to be much uh, shorter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here I would like I would like to completely change gear, but this is on purpose. It's also to show you how transversal is nano optics. So we have seen basically how we can use it to try to push the limit of, let's say, experimental physics. I would like to show you here that the same nano optical system can be used to develop some new tools for diagnostic. Here, the, let's say, ultimate uh, motivation is to have a device that enables basically to monitor our health on the molecular scale. So ideally with a simple, fast, and low cost uh, test. So you would like ideally from a single drop of blood to be able to have a device they're gonna detect very shortly and, and, and cheaply uh, some biomarkers. And you wanna do that not really for diagnostic, but more to screen a population. So to, be, to see who are people with a, a risk to develop a disease and therefore to send them to the clinics after that also for uh, what is called treatment monitoring. So basically this is toward personalized medicine when you want basically to adapt the treatment very accurately to the, to the patient. So we follow a strategy that is followed by many groups that is so-called lab on chip technology and I like very much this illustration because this is really what it is. You want to put one or several functionalities of a normal analytical lab on a small piece of device, okay? For that, what you need to do is basically to combine three different uh, ingredients. Uh, the optical nanoresonator is going to be your machinery. Uh, this is what's going to report on the presence of the biomarker within the blood of the sample. Microfluidics are somehow defining the walls of the, of the laboratory. So the doors and the corridors and the lab space. And finally, here we're going to have to put some biochemistry. And this is mostly to make the sensor uh, specific to a given type of molecule and not to all kind of molecule you can find within the, the blood. 
So this is very simple. The physics behind it is very simple. The physics is based on the fact that basically, uh, as I said before, this metallic nanoparticle, in that case gold nanoparticle, they are nanoresonators and they are very sensitive to the environment. They have an evanescent mode that is localized at the metal surface. And so whenever we're going to change something at the surface of the nanoparticle, the resonance will be altered. So if I have a nanoparticle, I functionalize it with some molecules, in that case antibodies, I measure basically the optical response of these guys, and they're going to be my reference. And then uh, whenever the particle will bind at the surface, I'm going to have a modification of the sensor, and this will uh, basically shift the resonance. So very much what is happening in the optomechanical uh, coupling of the nanoparticle within the cavity. So eventually, uh, I don't know if you remember your, your chemistry or biochemistry course for those of you that have uh, had some, basically. This is the typical shape of a binding of a molecule, basically, at the surface, so between a, an antibody and, a, and an antigen. So eventually, we're going to have some resonators. So these are gold nanoparticles that are fabricated by beam lithography, and we're going to integrate them into this microfluidic environment. It's a quite complex uh, environment, actually, because there are two layers of PDMS on top of each other. The blue one is really the flow, uh, the sample, let's say, uh, uh, fluidic network. So this is where we have the nanoresonators. And on top of that, actually, we have a red network that controls some valves. And this is going to be somehow the doors of the laboratory. Eventually, when this is assembled, this is what you get. So this is a small piece of a few square centimeters. It's next to this uh, one euro coin. And you can guess the different uh, channels the inlet, the outlet, and the nanoresonators are, of course, too tiny to be seen, but they are the center of the chip. I would like to show you quickly what is the last generation of what we have been doing. So this is a kind of a matrix, as you can say, a, a device. And this device is able to detect four different cancer markers in directly in the human serum, so in clean blood. And basically, I'm going to show you how this device actually interface with a computer and we can really control the whole assay just pressing a button. So all these different colors you see here, all these different steps are actually sequences of the assay. As I said, controlled by the microfluidics and itself controlled by the, the computer. And of course we put color here to make it nice, but this is not the real uh, color. But basically this is the rinsing, this is the incubation, these are the different things you need to do the detection. Eventually, we're able to detect, so these four different uh, markers are related to breast cancer, and we are not only able to say there is a bit of this, there is this, 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 and this one in the blood, but we know exactly, quantitatively, with an accuracy of about 25%, what is the actual concentration within the, the sample. So actually, uh, this led uh, to the creation of a company. So just before Christmas, we uh, created a much more, let's say, industry compatible uh, implementation of it. And this is called Droplight. This is a collaboration between uh, ICFO and another company. And basically, uh, there is now an uh, entrepreneur team, and they are pushing the technology toward, uh, toward market. And they're going to start with veterinary uh, applications. I would like to merge, uh, using a bit of uh, a few minutes, a couple of minutes, uh, the optical and the thermal uh, properties. So I'm going to show an, a, let's say, concept related to this uh, lab on a chip technology, where basically we're going to use both the optical and the thermal at the same time. Let me define the problematics first. Uh, in typical device I've been showing, you have the sensors that are very flat, and they are lying down at the bottom of my surface, of my chip. So they are typically a few tens of nanometers. And there is a big channel that is about 10 micron thick. And in fact, eventually, uh, the sensitivity, more than the sensitivity, the time it's going to take to detect a given concentration of molecule is going to be determined by the diffusion of the molecule throughout this channel. They're going to have to reach the sensor in order to be detected. And this is a real problem because now we have sensors that are very sensitive. Some of them can actually detect single molecules. But the problem is that the assay would take hours and hours. And so this is not practical. 
So I would like to show a way to break somehow uh, these laws. And so for that, we're going to use an effect that has been this called electrothermoplasmic effect that has been used in another context. And so what we, the whole idea is that basically we're going to have the sensor that is at the surface. We're going to use it to monitor so the change in resonance, as I showed before. But also we're going to use it to heat up locally the solution, the liquid. Okay? By heating up locally, we're going to create a gradient of temperature. This will create a local change. Well, this Christophe will understand better than I do. Uh, we're going to change locally the electrical conductivity. And then I'm going to have two plate electrodes here that are going to, due to that, be able to generate kind of a convection uh, flow. So with that, we want to break the diffusion limit I was saying before and eventually improve the dynamics or the kinetics of the sensor. So as I said before, we're going to use the same plasmonic structure both to sense and to heat up. I don't enter into details, but there is a way with an elongated particles to have two resonances, one along the long axis and one along the short axis. And we're going to use one for heating up, another one for sensing. And this is how it, let's say, this is what is the result. This is uh, where you have the sensor. We're going to put some beads in order to see the dynamics of the fluids and basically Normally, you would have a laminar flow in this kind of system, and everything would go, and as I said, would have to diffuse down to, uh, to the sensor. But here, sorry for that. Let me see. Ah, unfortunately, let me see if I can activate. Uh, ah, OK. So here you are, basically, this is the dynamic you observe. So there is somehow the sensor is here, and so this is why we heat up. And somehow you see how, basically, all the fluid is going down and kind of refocusing toward the sensor, toward the bottom. So these are experimental data, these are simulations. And basically, this is the transversal simulation. So basically, this is a top view, of course. And you can see how the fluid is kind of pushed toward the bottom before going down again. And eventually, if you use this kind of effect, that is, interestingly, using both the optical and thermal uh, properties, you're going to be able to make the sensing uh, faster. Am I? Done with the time, or do I have five minutes? Now I want to show you the pure thermal. So what do we do with uh, the photothermal properties of these plasmonic nanoparticles? For this story, for those of you who are not familiar, this has been always a complaint in the community to say, OK, plasmonic is good, it's focusing light down to the sub scale, but unfortunately, it has losses. And this creates a lot of problems. And everybody has been in the community complaining about that. So what I'm going to show here is how we kind of accept the fatality, and we use it as an enabling tool. Okay, So we're going to force the system to generate heat, and we're going to try to do something good with it. I'm going to, I'm going to show two briefly two, two uh, applications. The first one may be surprising to you, to 3D printing. You are all familiar with 3D printing. You know this is used in many different contexts. Now in automotive, lenses, even the glasses of our lenses, actually now 3D printed. Of course, in the lab here, prototyping, and etc. cetera. There are, there are three motivations, basically. You want the system to be robust. You want to produce rapidly, not like the one we have in the labs, usually, that are very slow. And you want also to be able to control, depending on the application, the color and the aesthetic of the system. And unfortunately, being here in the sweet spot is very difficult. There is a technique that is very promising, that is fulfilling these two guys, but basically fail in controlling the, uh, the color. This is how it works. So basically, you have a bed of polymers, polymer beads, sorry. And you basically going to drop some ink at the region where you want to print. You're going to shine light. And eventually, because the heat is absorbent, you're going to heat up locally, and you're going to sinter the adjacent beads. You're going to do that with one layer, two layers, etc., etc., and you're going to be able to build your system. Unfortunately, right now, the ink that I use in industry are actually carbon black. So of course, because they are carbon-based, they give this kind of dark uh, designs. And so you cannot control the aesthetic. And this is, believe me, uh, an issue uh, for, for the 3D printing industry. So you have understood 
I'm sure you have guessed that what we do here is basically to use Plasmonics as an ink to address uh, this issue. So we're going to design a plasmonic ink that is invisible in the that is invisible, that has no significant absorption in the visible region, that uh, absorbs very efficiently in the near infrared, and eventually we're going to be able to create. So this is what is printed with carbon black, and this is what we can achieve uh, with uh, gold or other metallic or uh, plasmonic nanomaterials. This is additionally much more efficient, and this is uh, this allows, let's say, uh, writing speed that are quite uh, compatible with what you require as the industry. And I'm going to show. So this is basically how, from a white object, we can basically transform that into a colorful object using some dyes. So things you cannot do uh, so far. The other application is a collaboration, again, from the photothermal uh, properties of these nanoparticles. It's a collaboration with a big multinational. It's a German company that is specialized, some of you may know, in surgical uh, pieces. Okay? And uh, when they explained that to us originally, uh, they are working, especially one of the star products, actually this uh, polymer mesh. And this mesh, maybe some of you in the room have them, actually, in the, in the valley. This is uh, basically what is used to reconstruct after whenever you have an hernia, whenever, well, basically the valley needs to be opened up. Okay? And the big problem is that they have a, a, a recurrence uh, incidence basically on the fact that if some bacteria are jumping in during the surgery, there's an infection, there's a formation of a biofilm, and eventually this is a disaster because the immune system is not strong enough to fight against a biofilm and eventually uh, you need to open up again and to remove the implant, okay? So they came to us with this problem, and again, you're gonna guess what is the solution behind. Uh, okay, this is the formation of the biofilm, I'll, I'll skip that, but basically, eventually what we do is to prepare this mesh and to modify them with some plasmonic nanoparticles. We do a lot of check on how robust is these things, because of course you don't want, once the mesh is in the body, you don't want the particle to be released, or et cetera. And so the whole idea is basically to use that as a prevention in order to avoid the attach, attachment sorry, of the bacteria and the formation of the biofilm. So uh, this is the surface. So this is one wire of the mesh. And this is the nanoparticles, quite high density. And basically, this is the kind of bacteria these guys are fighting against. So this is this uh, Staphylococcus. And so uh, what we are doing is studying bas basically the kind of illumination, pulse versus CW, in order to optimize basically the prevention and to, to not only kill the bacteria, but also to, let's say, rather than killing them, what we want, we want to avoid them to attach and to, and to structure into a biofilm, okay? And so this is where we are right now. We, we, so this is ex vivo, and we're going to start, let's say, uh, with uh, mice. Uh, some first in vivo experiments. So I've been, I'm sorry, I've been a bit fast on the, on the very end. Uh, so very importantly, you have seen in each of the slides, let's say important, the key people of each of the, of the projects, but this is the full team, more or less an updated uh, picture. You are here people from not only all nationalities, but also from different backgrounds. So there is here our core physicists, uh, telecom engineers, biochemists, a bit of everything. And basically, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, yes, I have two questions about um, automechanics with nanosphere. Um, the first one is, uh, I don't know if it is the same mechanism, but when we try to make parametric cooling, uh, we observed a cooling of one quadrature and a heating of the other quadrature. So I don't know if it is the same here. So we it don't observe this kind of, uh, of effect in the case of the nanoparticle. We don't. Okay. It's not a mechanism like a swing? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, indeed. Okay, indeed. Yeah. And the second one, uh, I, I, I didn't understand how you measure with the homodyne detection. Okay. Uh, are you measuring the three axes at the same time? And are you cooling the three axes or only one? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I went very fast on that. So, <coughs> so in fact, what we do is uh, using D-mirror, 
So we detect the light scattered by the nanoparticle in transmission. We filter the trapping laser, and we have kind of a probing beam okay, that is frequency shifted. Uh, and, so, and, and, and um, let's say cross-polarized. So we isolate the scattering. And out of that, we're going to use the D-mirrors in order to separate the X, the Y, and the Z scattering. And then we have this balanced photodetector, uh, the typical from New Focus. Or, and, and then out of that, we're going to extract basically the homodyne signal of the three different directions. And, and, and then to answer your question, yes, indeed. Uh, we're going to then take the information of the X, Y, and Z, and we're going to send sum up everything to the EOM. And basically, uh, this will cool down the free axis at the same time. Uh, the question probably is, is a naive one, but what is a phonon for you? I understand very well what is the temperature, because there's a single. For me, a phonon is what you have inside, but. Uh, uh, how can you define a phonon uh, in your case? Apologies for the... And then, the, and then I have another question yeah. again, mm -hmm. I mean, just for... Uh, in which sense uh, uh, is optomechanics? For me, optomechanics is a coupled equation. Mm -hmm. So you have field and then yes. a retroaction from the mechanical system. Yes. In that sense, I cannot see, even though it's a bit philosophical, it's very no, no, beautiful no, I, things I think what so, I'm saying. This is a good, so this is a good point. A, so let, let me answer thanks. the first one. So about the definition, when I talk about phonons, I mean, literally, this is maybe not the best way of saying that. What I'm, t I'm saying is that basically these are quanta of the mechanical motion of the center of mass. So these are basically energy divided by h bar omega m. OK? So this is, this is what I mean with phonons. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the second one, ah, yeah. The second one, you're fully right. When I don't introduce a cavity, um, this is not really an optomechanical system. This is a nanomechanical system. And then whenever I couple that to a cavity, this becomes an optomechanical system. You're right on that, yeah. yeah you, you mentioned briefly the uh, con <coughs> cancer uh, tracers, uh, detectivity. Yes. So can you uh, comment a bit on the sensitivity that you yes. reach with the system compared to other, other uh, techniques? Yes. So the sensitivity here is eventually, to say it briefly, is more or less the same that you would get with a so-called ELISA kind of test. You know this uh, ELISA plate, so the typical biochemical assay you would use now with fluorophores and things like that. This is comparable. So, important, yeah, that's very important what you ask, because if you have an integrated things like that, a device for, for, for screening or for, for detection of biomarkers, you cannot aim at doing better than a, a robot, these huge robots that are in the big laboratories or or machine that costs between hundreds of K and, and, and 1 million euros. So basically, uh, here what you aim at doing is to have a reasonable sensitivity, to have a good reliability, but to be able to do that faster and cheaper. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, there are applications where this doesn't matter, but there are applications where this matter. Let me give you, in fact, to be honest with you, oncology is not the most relevant for this kind of integrated uh, technology. This is more relevant, just imagine an emergency room, or just imagine a pathology that evolves very fast, where basically you would go to the doctor's office, and uh, within 10 minutes, you would have an information, precious, in order to take a decision. So this is more in that sense. And, and so that was not my intention to, to give the impression that that could compete with uh, you know, the, the whole industry of uh, biochemical assay that is super performant. The only thing is that it's very expensive and it's very slow as well. In the feedback controls, yes. um, you mentioned that you are also introdu introducing noise just by the feedback system itself. Yes. Is there some, what are the possibilities to reduce this part of the, of the noise? Or? Um, um, this is difficult because and, and, and probably in the room, there are people that know better than, uh, these things than I do. Eh? Um, whenever you do an active feedback, the way I see that is that you, you need to detect a signal, an optical signal. You need to process the, electric, the electronic signal. You need then to, you know, to, to just to manipulate information. And each of these steps is going to introduce some noise. Mm -hmm. And so that's the reason why I believe somehow more in the passive cooling that is with the cavity, although there are big issues there as well. But basically, then you need to fight against all noise, 
let's say, introduction you are creating at each of the steps. And so it become, let's say, a kind of a technological issue. And it's not an easy one. It's definitely a complicated one. Mm -hmm. So this is the way I understand that. Yeah. So if I can ask a second question. In this levitating uh, device that we are yes. describing, you see a plateau uh, for the yes. uh, temperature set. And you mentioned the recall there. Yes. So what would you do to go to the ground state, the true ground state of this uh, yes. optical trap? I mean, what are the possibilities to create really a pure state of the yeah. uh, center of mass motion? Of you mean state? to overcome the recoil somehow, to, it, to, 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 avoid, uh, to avoid this uh, limitation well, by recoil? I don't think there will be always a limit, right? I mean, yes. in laser cooling, there so, is always a limit. And, and the question is, you want to make it smaller than H bar, uh, yes. uh, smaller than KT, and so... How far are you from uh, making n equal one or two that, okay. you know, uh, No, no. It's, uh, so uh, first related, so this is a real issue, this thing that is saturating and that is due to, to recoil. But here, let's say, what I should say is that the only way to over, overcome, uh, overcome that and to go to lower occupation, uh, phonon occupation is basically to have a cooling rate that overcome the uh, scattering uh, recoil rate, okay? And so if you can do that, then you're going to be able to push that all the way down. Um, again, the cavity can enable to do that maybe in a more efficient way. So if we can have really an efficient cooling of the cavity, we should be able to reach more easily, I believe, uh, the N1 or the N much uh, smaller than 1. Right now, the best best that I know done this is actually not done in my group. It's in, in the group of uh, Novotny and ETH. Uh, this is 20 phonons. This is the best that is that's been done right now, starting at room temperature. Interestingly, with a nanoparticle, it's about 2,000 Kelvin. But center of mass, we've only uh, 20 phonons, which is, which is beautiful, I think. Like huge absolute yeah. temperature and. So it's a bit a technical question, but yeah. how do you control the charge of the particle while yes. it's levitating? Yes. So, in fact, it's very simple, and and we so we first observed it, and then we try to understand it. So, you remember the picture I have in the? Okay. So in fact, in fact, it's not super clear. But so this is the the vacuum chamber, and there is over there uh, an electrode where we're going to apply a high high voltage. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to be in moderate vacuum with still quite a lot of uh, air molecules. And we're going to use the so-called uh, corona discharge effect. They're going to enable, basically, to kind of ionize uh, the air molecule and eventually to use this molecule in order to charge or discharge uh, the particle. Just by changing the polarity of my electrode, I'm going to be able to either do one thing or do the other one. And you can do that very, very accurately. How we measure that, basically, this is by applying a modulation to the electric field at a given frequency. And we're going to see a, a peak popping up in the power, power spectrum density. And the height of this peak is going to be directly proportional to the charge, uh, related to the charge. Hmm. And just how do you change the polarity of the charge? Uh, so by inverting the, the the, the, the sign of the voltage, basically, at, at, the, at, the, at the electrodes, at the plasma, let's say, not, not the plasma. The, the big electrode that actually we don't see here, that is uh, somewhere away here in the chamber. Okay. And so this is by changing so it's the... So it's not in between the two electrodes? No, 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 so, no, no. Oh. this is another electrode that is far away, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Another question? Okay, so I think we can thank again Romain.